So, ladies and gentlemen, on my right, I'm delighted to welcome Har Devine, a wise head in the industry. He was dealmaker in chief at ABC Studios, managing a team of executives and stru that structures and negotiates the studio business dealings with above the line talent. Writers, producers, directors, and actors with platforms, networks, exhibitors that license the studio programming. Uh, formerly vi Executive Vice President of Business Operations, ABC Studios. He was with Disney for 24 years. All hail Jane Turton, I have to say, the new chair of the RTS. I think we should give her a round of applause. Um, she has signed up for three years, but apparently some chairs of RTS can be for six years. So let's just see. <laughs> Um, how Jane uh, decides how long she wants to stay. She's the CEO, as we've just heard, of All Three Media, a position she's held for four years since the business was acquired by Discover Discovery and Liberty Global. Uh, there is nothing that Jane does not know about mergers and acquisitions. She has a deep understanding and experience of international broadcasting and production, marrying business acumen and creative skills. As such, she oversees a network of award-winning independent production, distribution, and digital digital companies organized in a federal structure with the All3 Media Group. Um, Dan McGolfin is Mr. Two Jobs. He is the controller of iPlayer, a single point of leadership for the service right across the BBC divisions, and he combines this with controller of programming for the BBC content division. Prior to that, Dan was controller of daytime, leading a commissioning team responsible for in excess of 1,000 hours of original content each year. Well, if uh, Dan McGoffin is Mr. Two Jobs, there's hardly any job that Julian Bellamy has not done in television. He's currently um, managing director of ITV Studios, the largest commercial production company in the UK, and the largest independent producer of non-scripted content in America. And of course, as you all know, previously, he was a creative leader in Discovery, Channel 4, and the BBC. So the idea is we've got 50 minutes, we'll probably do about half an hour and then uh, open uh, the conversation up to the floor and do raise the lights a little bit. It's quite nice to see who the audience actually are and making sure they're still awake. So <laughs> let's raise the lights a little bit as I begin. Uh, we've got a meaty subject, um, but um, let's start with a little local difficulty. Let's start uh, with iPlayer rights, Dan. Uh, why is it so important? <laughs> That you're going to be uh, straight in. <laughs> We've only got 50 minutes. <laughs> Why is it so important that it's a year and not a month? Okay, so some people said that um, a year is an arbitrary amount of time, which I thought was a curious thing because there's nothing man made about one Earth orbit of the Sun. It's, um, and that sounds a bit more profound than I mean it. The, um, it needs to be a year because it's a year's worth of content. So at Christmas, here's your year's worth of content. It means that things that are on a yearly cycle, like The Apprentice, well, summer to summer. will always... It doesn't need to be Christmas to Christmas. Well, it's, it's a straightforward thing, isn't it? It would be arbitrary if you were to say, here's the last 30 days' worth, or here's the last three months' worth, here's the last nine months. What we're saying is, here's a year's worth of content. TV works in seasons, right? So it means that during the summer, if there's less being released, actually you've got a year's worth of output. It means that at Christmas, you've got the year's worth of output. It means that if you go... So I play at any point in time, something that's on a yearly cycle like The Apprentice will be there. And when we're looking at the kind of viewing that we're getting beyond 30 days now, it's substantial. So things like Killing Eve, it's about 40% um, after 30 days and growing. And actually some other things as well, like um, Civilizations is, is over 30% um, of viewing beyond 30 days now. So TV is changing. I think what's curious is, you know, we all go to these conferences and uh, talk about how things are changing, how the models are changing, how viewers are changing, but then somehow there's a sort of an amnesia when we apply that to what the broadcasters need to do. I think, um, you know, we need to recognize that our license fee payers, many of them are young and many of them aren't watching broadcast TV in traditional ways anymore. They watch in a different way now. And actually this model of there's just a few episodes up available for catch-up doesn't work for them because it's all tied to a TX and broadcast in that way for them is not working in the same way. Does that sound reasonable, Jane? Yeah, look, I mean, everybody, I think any producer in this country will say they want a strong BBC. And if part of a strong BBC is a strong iPlayer, which seems to me to be sensible, we would be, I mean, entirely supportive of the right window on the iPlayer. I think that the rub is on the right terms. Mm. And I think, you know, Pact is discussing, I know, with the BBC, a deal. And I think the deal has to work, because if there is a sacrifice of value for the production community, of course we're going to ask that that's made good through some change to the terms of trade with the BBC. So, hugely supportive. I mean, look, just to be clear, the PSB's 
we are and remain our single most important customer base. We want them to be strong. And but I think this them, is part of that. you want them to actually pay for what they get. Yes, we want them to pay for what they get. And we're potentially seeing an erosion of value if we have a free extension on the BBC. So clearly, we're going to come beetling up the path and ask for that to be sorted. But is there a danger that it looks like you are holding a gun to producers' heads? Uh, well, we're absolutely not doing that. We've made it clear that con commissions aren't dependent on that. But we do need to recognise there is a, there's a changing of the value structure of the economics. So our licence fee payers pay to it and expect to have provision to be able to see that service. And if they want to watch in a different way, we have to recognise that. The value of what we're getting at the moment is in decline. Uh, the value to those licence fee payers is in decline. We know that the over... I mean, if we take... I don't know, let's take... Can I give an example of a, yeah. of a genre? So let's take comedy. So we know that the overnights aren't what they were for comedy. But, you know, the BBC wants to continue investing lots of money in comedy. Um, if our viewers want to watch comedy in a different way, then they need a longer period of time to, to see that on our service. And that's good for our viewers. It's what they need. It's good for producers who are likely to get recommissioned. It's good for the BBC's investment in comedy over the long term. It's also good commercially because... Yeah, but it, it can be good for everybody, like motherhood and apple pie. <laughs> but producers have actually got to have some value out of something. And what you're saying is that iPlayer, right, has got to be there for a year. You have to really, I mean, you know, you, what John McVeigh would say is you are holding a gun to producers' heads and you actually need to pay for what you get because, after all, there's a number of other places they can go now. Well, there are, and, um, you know, there are lots of places and lots of broadcasters are changing the way they operate. I think that, um, you know, if you look at the rights we're asking for, um, I think we're still asking for a lot less than, say, if you go and do a deal with a, with a global SVOD. Julian. Yeah, I mean, I'd echo a lot of what, what, what Jane said. Look, I mean, you know, uh, first and foremost, I think it's very important, you know, um, uh, I completely understand, actually, where the BBC are coming from, the importance of the 12-month window, and I understand that we all want to support and rally around uh, anything that strengthens the public service, you know, uh, broadcasting ecology. Um, you've got to weigh that against, obviously, my first duty is to protect the interests of ITV studios and the producers within it. Actually, to that end, we've had um, uh, productive conversations with the BBC over the last few weeks and months, and I think we're getting to a place where we can see a way to make it work. So um, have you moved so them along a bit? Well, I th I'm not going to get into the ins and outs of, ha of what we've go. agreed. Uh, I'm sure you'd like me to. I would. Um, but I think we're getting to... <laughs> what a surprise! <laughs> Um, but look, we're in a place where I think we can get to, we can see a way in which this could work, and we're willing to give it a go. Um, just from the other side of the pond, looking out at the bigger story here, I mean, that's just the kind of tip of the looming battle uh, between SVOD streamers, traditional broadcasters, versus the producer, kind of three-way fight for rights. Um, what's the American experience of this hard divine? Because, you know, who is actually going to win? Because we look at, look at Disney. I mean, Disney had all three. I mean, Disney had everything, has everything. Tell me what the rights issue looks like from where you are. Um, well, uh, you know, looking at it from the perspective of a, of a studio, um, the more players you have, the more buyers you have, this is a wonderful time to be a producer, a wonderful yeah. time to be a studio. I mean, there's, there's no denying it. Um, I've seen the, uh, the, the recent statistics here in this country about how you, you broke records last year in terms of revenue generated by, the, by, uh, by, by production here in the UK, which is, which is you know, uh, evidence of how vibrant and, and, um, and thriving the, the business is. In the United States, um, it, it gives a studio a portfolio. It gives a studio various ways to, um, to seek to, uh, to uh, provide its programming to the right broadcaster or the right platform, and each one of those things provides a different business model. Um, the, the SVOD players now, um, from our perspective, was sort of a little bit in a way, it's a, somewhat of a double-edged sword. It's a breath of fresh air in one way, and what I mean by that is, all of a sudden you have someone who's willing not only to fund 100% of the cost of production, but to also to give you a significant premium in, in, in addition to that. Um, our business historically, the studio business in America, was heavily deficiting. And it was uh, a hit-driven business where you would deficit significant millions per episode for quite a long period of time, hoping to eventually get that hit, that CSI, Grey's Anatomy, Big Bang, and so forth that would wash away all the losses and then you know, provide a, a significant uh, income to the, or significant profit margin to the company. Now you have the SVOD players who give you an opportunity to do relatively large 
budget programming for very little risk. Um, in fact, for no risk. Now, but your, your upside is no, no. Your upside is moderated. Well, you're giving you're giving up rights. You're giving yeah. up a certain license for a relatively long period of time. The global uh, SVOD players now take essentially run of series plus a certain tail beyond that, five years, ten years, with the studio having a certain ability to exploit maybe a linear run after four years, and that's turned out to have some degree of profit. So from, a, from the American studio perspective, we are keeping the rights. We own the IP, we own the underlying copyright, we are licensing a certain bundle of rights to each one of these platforms or networks. That hasn't changed. It I, I, can I just add to that? I, I, I do think, I, I, I'd echo a lot of that, but I would say it's very important when we talk about the new world of the OTTs that we don't just, they're, they're not just one homogenous block. The OTTs actually are very different. They have different business models, they have different strategies, they're talking to different audiences, they will have different perspectives on rights, they'll have different perspectives on co-productions and originals, and in the end, the business is still the same. It is still in the end about if you have a great idea with an undeniable piece of talent and you're selling it into a competitive context, guess what, you can get a better deal. Yeah, and but, and, and I mean, that, what? at the end, that leverage is still is still at the end the heartbeat of the business. Yeah, I mean, what Tim Hinks and uh, Stephen Lambert were talking about yesterday was, but I think they were talking to Netflix, so I wasn't actually keep, yeah, about Netflix, but I was saying, you can keep rights, you can do hard negotiations. It helps, if, of course, if you're a bigger producer. Yeah, I mean, look, again, depending on, on, on the context and, and, and the show you have, the leverage you have, well, and the leverage, you're talking to, yeah. yes, you can, absolutely. And look, you know, a very good example of that is Quibi, for example, one of the new mobile SVODs led by Jeffrey Katzenberg a model that absolutely has producer ownership at its heart. I can think of five or six different conversations, I'm sure Jane can too, that we're having with OTT players that absolutely involves figuring out how a producer can benefit from the success of a show above and beyond just simply cost plus. And I do think one of the interesting things that I think will be to keep an eye on over the next couple of years is as competition intensifies, because remember half of these OTTs haven't launched yet, as that intensifies, to what extent will that competition drive more creative deal making? I think I think that will be one thing that would be fascinating to see. Yeah, the but, but as we were just talking in that previous session, we'll come on to talk about. You know, if you're talking about seven or eight, there'll be aggregation, there'll be acquisition, there'll be there'll be a narrowing again, probably within five years, won't there? Um, I, I don't know about that. I mean, uh, look, you know, the story at the moment is um, more buyers, more competition. Is it springtime for producers? Yeah, it's good. It's been a huge stimulus. I mean, look, we talk about stimulus like it's just an economic thing, and they've put a lot of money in, and there's no doubt about that. But actually, I think creatively it's been very stimulating mm. as well. And I'm not a creative. I don't pretend to be. But I bet you if you stopped a creative in the street today and said, how does it feel, they will say to you, we're pitching paper ideas to OTT players, and we're being commissioned. Now, that's, that's an extraordinary statement. So in the old days, it was acquisition. Then it moved into co-production. Then it moved into original commissions in scripted. And now we're moving into a place where it's original commissions off paper in factual entertainment and entertainment. And that feels very like a conversation that one might have expected to have with Channel 4. Mm -hmm. And still does, by the way, but yes, is, now quickly, also having, um, is now also having with a Netflix or an Amazon. So I think... It's in, the stimulus, in all senses, has been extraordinary. But, but and got different real rights, examples. But, but you still have different rights. But it was ESBs always that, Kirsty. You, you always had different rights. You know, if you do a cable deal with David Zaslav, yep. you were assigning your rights to Discovery for the whole world, by the way, forever. Yep. Now, if you do, and that's a model, and you did that because that was a fabulous long-term partnership with good production margin. You do a different type of deal with Channel 4, New Terms of Trade. You do a different type of deal with the BBC or ITV. You do a different type of deal with Fox. You do a different type of deal with Netflix. We've always, we've always worked in this complicated but world of different types indie, of deals. But if you're a small indie... Fine, if you're a small indie, you have a good idea. Julian's absolutely right. The leverage doesn't just come from scale. It comes from the quality of the idea. You, you go into a room... You go into a... Particularly in America... If you get into the room... You will get into the room in the States if you have a good idea. You have good auspices, as the Americans love to say. In you go. And you I have must remember option. that. If I tell a small indie that's just started up, you have good auspices, you'll get straight to I'm the I'm never head. quite sure what it means, but it's a good thing, I hear. Um, so good auspices, and you're in there, and it's competitive, and then you will have much more like a pitching battle than us polite Europeans tend to have, Dan. and it works. Dan? I think that um, the Ofcom report said that the, the SVODs did something like uh, 200 hours of UK content last year compared to the PSBs doing something like 32,000. 
So I think you know, we have to be a bit careful about saying that you know, there's the, the, all the small Indians out there are going to be able to pitch loads of hours to, to SWAS. What we really need to do is protect our PSB ecology, and through yeah. things like iPlayer being successful, through the collaboration with BritBox, these are attempts to... But, these, but, but you know, that, uh, the thing is, aren't you working against the tide, Dan? The truth is, you, know, you talk about the ratio at the moment. The ratio is going to change massively in the next two years. Well, but nothing... also, it's not either or. No. We want to do all yeah, of it. Yeah, agreed. I'm agreed. super agreed, agreed about all. this stuff, by the way. Agreed, and, and, and absolutely, those come up together, and obviously, we're working with us, VODs, too, in, um, both in terms of output deals and in terms of co-production. So I think it, these are interesting times, but we do need to protect that. I mean, yeah, sure, the SVODs can increase the amount of local content they're going to do, but I think they're going to be challenged to do more if there's a healthy PSB ecology in, in a country, because you know, if, if they don't have to produce locally, then they won't, they won't need to. But if they have to you know, raise to that bar, if they have to make things that really are relevant to people, then, um, then that's going to be good, but, good but, overall. But, but in terms of, I mean, just talking about you know, even, even things like finding your audience, developing your audience, channeling your audience in, in, into things that have got depth, we're hearing in the previous session, your problem at the BBC is going to be both eyeballs and relevance. And the new Ofcom report said that brand recognition amongst young people is really, really low. Well, that's exactly why we can't be disaggregated and why iPlayer is so important. If we allow um, programs to go on um, other services entirely and we don't have any control over that brand attribution, then, then yes, people are going to think, why are we paying for the licensee? That's exactly why iPlayer is so important. If a young person watches all their BBC shows in other places, then why are they going to continue to pay the licensee? That's bad for our industry. It's bad for producers. It's bad for the long-term health of of UK broadcasting. Um, you mentioned Channel 4 a minute ago, but is Channel 4 particularly vulnerable, you think, in this ecology? Well, look, I mean, you'd have to ask Alex that. I, I, we love Channel 4 as an independent sector. They are the biggest commissioners, remember, of independent television in the country. People always think it's the BBC because the budget's bigger, but actually, if you look at what Channel 4 spends, I think, check with Alex, I'm sure it's a bigger number. Um, are they vulnerable? They don't produce. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they have a slightly different operating model. And I guess that means they don't own IP in the same way. And, and they're the only, I mean, even if you think about uh, other people producing, they're the only, you know, everybody's producing now. Disney's producing. Netflix did a deal with Miller World. They may do others. Everybody's producing. They're the only ones. Yeah, and possibly that, I mean, it's certainly different. I mean, but they do innovate. And I think the innovation, presumably, to some extent, is, is the answer to the challenge of the long term of all of these yeah. brands, isn't it? What about Channel 4? Well, I used to be, as you know, the controller of Channel 4. There was nowhere you didn't in, work. In the, in, the, in the distant past. And I remember, it was back in 2007, and I remember hearing various doomsday prophecies about, you know, the impending end of Channel 4 and the broken model and how it was all going to go to down the plug hole in three years' time. And, of course, here we are 11 years later, and actually, from my point of view, Channel 4 looks pretty strong, and I think, um, uh, um, and actually is in pretty fine shape. I would say that I, I think it's a very good example, actually, their rights deal that Jane mentioned, I think very good example of how um, businesses, particularly local businesses, that can identify what in the end, what are the rights they need to really drive their business. Mm -hmm. And Channel 4, I think, have had a very enlightened and smart way of thinking about it around, we need more UK rights and we'll trade them for uh, international rights with producers. And I think very good example, actually, of how you don't necessarily need a big production arm. You don't necessarily need ultimate ownership to continue to sort of future-proof your business. And I think, I think that kind of thinking, identifying what rights are really at the heart of your business, I suspect we'll see more of. Let's move on then to talk uh, and coming back uh, uh, to you on the question of, well, let's say the latest, Peacock. That's the latest one. Mm. All the streamers. You know, we're just hearing eight, there are eight big players at the moment. Obviously, Apple TV doesn't come on until uh, the 1st of November. Um, Howard, do you think they're all sustainable in the long term? I mean, how many different subscriptions <coughs> are people going to want to have? How many are they going to afford? How do they make those decisions? Well, that's the question I think we're all facing. It's going to be hard to see. Um, it's, it's hard to answer that question right now with most of those services having not yet launched. Um, you know, the question is, what is the value proposition to the customer, to the subscriber? Um, I think Disney um, uh, has an, an incredibly smart approach, which is that uh, to differentiate yourself, um, Disney Plus is going to be terribly brand focused. And it has probably, well, the Disney brand is probably the most iconic, most powerful brand in the world in terms of entertainment branding. And then they follow it on with, Pixar, Lucas, Marvel, 
Nat Geo, all very, very powerful brands. This is how you differentiate yourself. So to the consumer, the value proposition is I can only get that programming if I go there. In fact, what David was saying when he was talking about how he's moved his company away from what those other big players are doing. It's another way of saying we are different. We have a differentiation. We have a different product. And if you want the product that we sell, you can only get it from us. So, how many of those can there be? Apple, they're in the technology business. I think they're really selling product. They're really selling their their iPhones and their iPads. Um, the Peacock. That's going to be more of a general entertainment proposition for Comcast, where they're providing more value to their Comcast subscribers. Um, Warner Media, um, I'm not really sure what that's going to look like ultimately. When you take something like Apple, I mean, their investment's going to be massive. They've got such deep pockets. Yeah, but they're new. They're new at it. And um, you look at still, I suspect, I mean, it, it'll be interesting to see what Reed Hastings says tomorrow, but a lot of their views are still driven by catalog. Mm -hmm. on Netflix, um, and they've taken 20 years to get to the place where they've got however many trillions of hours today to offer. I think for Apple, the mountain to climb is just quality volume of content. Um, I, I don't know is the answer. None of us knows. Um, what, we, what we like as producers is there are more buyers with big budgets coming looking for content. Right. Um, you know, we're slightly Which puts, again, a pressure on the BBC massively. Why would people come to the BBC when they can go perhaps get much bigger budgets from somewhere like Apple, who seem like they're going to have a new business model, it's going to seem different to producers? Yeah, well, there's nothing to stop um, all those companies spending lots of money. Um, Jane says they're new to some things. I think, you know, broadcasters traditionally have been very strong at the live end. So, um, you know, we do news, we do sports, you know, all these things are getting watched on iPlayer. Um, we do a whole range that um, most of those SVODs have concentrated in certain genres till now. You're right, there's nothing to stop them expanding. But when you look at the amount of content we do, I mean, when I see... Um, you know, some of the figures we're now getting on iPlayer, we're starting to see growth now. We had the Women's World Cup doing really well over the summer. We had Killing Eve getting um, 100 million requests on iPlayer now. Um, we've had Glastonbury and, and Wimbledon doing new things. So iPlayer's not trying to do everything. We're not trying to be um, what those SVOD um, things are doing. We're not trying to have the library that's the size that they're doing. We're trying to combine a sort of an offering that involves everything that's TV that the BBC does. It's all, the, all of BBC TV in, in one place and bringing that together. So yes, we do need longer windows, but we're not just about that. We're also about the live element. And in terms of archive, it's going to be a curated selection of archive. It's not going to be everything. Um, so that's why we can work well with BritBox. We're not trying to be the whole market. Um, you know, BritBox is another additional offering the BBC is involved in, another place for rights holders to, to sell their content. Okay, the lights up, please, because we're going to take uh, 10 minutes of questions and then come back around the panel. So uh, we've got microphones up. Let's have a first question, please. Yeah, um, down here, keep your hand up till it comes to you, please. And then there was a question down here on the right-hand side as well, so we can get the microphone there too at the same time. Thank you. Yes, fire away, just announce who you are. Oh, it's uh, Jeff Norton. Um, Kirsty, you mentioned the, um, the Miller World deal with Netflix, and I'm, I'm interested maybe to get Jane and Julian's perspective on the big OTTs doing direct deal either yeah. with IP or with talent, Shondaland, um, the Skybound deal with Amazon. And are you guys ever bumping up against the fact where those buyers might be saying to you, actually, you know, we don't want, we don't want what you're selling right now. We're actually going to do it in-house. We're well, sort of act, acting as a studio because we've got those rights already. That, that's happened with, I think I'm right in saying with Peter Morgan. I mean, that just, just happened. What about that, uh, Julian? Well, look, you know, uh, in order, you know, whoever the winners and losers will be going forward, you know, they're going to need the best shows, right? Uh, you, you can have all the technology and distribution you like and the brand you like. In the end, you need the best shows. And very quickly, that gets you to IP and talent, right? And so, look, all of us, producers, broadcasters, you know, OTT players, everyone is after um, uh, trying to get and attract the best talent. Um, outside of the UK, we are uh, effectively an independent studio. And what it means if you're an independent is absolutely you need to be able to attract the, the best talent. Uh, undeniable talent with a great idea still gives you leverage. Um, so look, of course there will be, and you will see it all around the world, not just with, with uh, the OTT players, you'll also see it in linear broadcasting, there will be a directional impulse towards some more vertical integration. But still in the end, for the best ideas, you still have the leverage. Jane. 
Yeah, no, and look, there have always been, we love exclusivity in television. It's one of the sort of bywords of telly, isn't it? Let's get everybody to do everything for us exclusively. So they always follow that path. It was always the case with the broadcast networks. The overall deal was invented by the broadcast network. So I think that's exactly as it always was. It's just a slightly different name on the contract nowadays. So I think it's not to say we're complacent, it's irritating. When you're trying to sell something, you find someone's tied into someone else exclusively, yeah. that's just really irritating. But, but, but you can overcome it, you find clever ways around it. We're smart, we're agile, we find smarter ways to do deals with different talent. We try to bring new people up, all of the stuff you'd expect us to say. It's not today a huge block and growing business. No. It's just mildly irritating. Mildly irritating, <laughs> mistress of understatement. I mean, I think you know if, you, if someone's going to sign up Peter Morgan, you'd be like, damn it. Yeah, but Peter Morgan's still writing Peter. the Crown with Andy yeah. for Netflix. So I mean, you know, we find ways of working around it. A line from you, Howard, on this whole idea of soaking up talent, buying up talent, doing individual deals. Well, I, I think that that's one of the ways that some of the studios are differentiating themselves is buying up talent. In a way, that's sort of that's the brand. Yeah. If you don't have your own. You know, I think of Sony, for example, which is in a very unique situation in the United States in that it does not have either a broadcast network, a cable network, or a platform. And so how does it differentiate itself? How does it compete? Because it's one of the big guys, and it competes now by buying. They've invested significantly in overall deal talent in order to be able to open those doors to create that sort of leverage that Julian was talking about when they bring that recognizable name across all of the SVOD players and create that bidding war. Question over here, thank you. Hi, thanks, Avery Katz. You talked about the fact that now is a great time and you felt a breath of fresh air from some of these OTT providers with respect to producing content, but my question is, are we at peak content today, especially when it comes to scripted dramas, given many of the buyers of this content seem to be funding it with leverage and there are questions around the sustainability of the competitive landscape? Thank you. Jane. Yeah, we get asked this a lot. Um, there's no evidence we're at peak. I mean, look, the number of commissioned dramas has gone up again year on year. It's actually flat and going down in the UK from the PSBs, but I think elsewhere is um, being compensated by money coming in from the SVOD players. Um, there's no evidence we're at peak content. If anything, one could assume that with the arrival of the new players, there will be more, not fewer series commissioned. So I think we're ambitious. We're continuing to invest in scripted, and we are growing scripted. Can I make so evidentially, I think it is growing. I have a somewhat different perspective. Yes. At least when I'm looking, and when I look at it purely from the scripted angle, I think we are very much at risk of being at that peak level, just because there is limited supply of great talent. And the well, more pro technical, t I mean, we're, uh, oh, we're, we're uh, absolutely... Behind, behind the camera, in front of the camera, executive talent. I can't tell you how many really, op really fantastic open creative positions and business positions existed across the major studios and networks in the United States that they cannot fill. Mm -hmm. Because there is full employment right now, and it's a great time, actually, to be a writer, producer, actor, director, or a executive who does what we do. In the, in the United States because of this peak yeah. uh, television. So I think there's going to be sort of a self-fulfilling natural set of events that's going to cause any increase beyond where we currently are to, to, to show in the quality because all the great people, can, there, there's just a finite amount yeah. of the best and the brightest and that, 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 that content is, is, is what's going to rise to the top. That is interesting and it's all yeah. about, if you even take it at the most, uh, you know, the, as it were, the, the grunt level, in terms of BBC training, other people training, I know that different, actually, SVODs are doing, are doing their own training as well. There's a real problem with talent in terms of, you know, even the, the grips, clapper loaders, all these people. Yeah, but, but hence the inflation, to yes, be fair. Yes, exactly. Budgets. But, but well, we're not, not making dramas because we can't find someone well, to turn the camera. Yeah, I mean, well, we've got a great record of the BBC at bringing talent through, working with the BBC, you know, talent comes through, is a great place to develop content. There's not enough content to go around at the moment, but, you know, working with a broadcaster is often a great way to start that journey. Question, yep. Yeah, so, David Lancel from PwC. Um, I just, having watched the Gen Z panel yesterday, I was curious to see and hear how the panel felt or thought differently about content development in light of that panel. They had a very different angle on life, right? For those of you who weren't in the, uh, uh, what, what was the actual uh, nub of it? Well, about Peter Buzzard gave that beautifully yesterday. Um, you know, authenticity, opinionated, lots of conversation, great commercial models, um, short attention spans, and then keeping it for a long time. That's probably a very poor summary, but that was my Julian. Time. 
Well, obviously we had a representation on that panel because we make Love Island, and 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 uh, so so look, I mean, I thought it was I thought it was really interesting actually, and I thought it speaks to this broader point that Jane mentioned earlier on that what we're talking about when we talk about change and evolution, it's not it's very easy to just simply see it through a deal making and economic lens when actually it's also I think a burst of new creative opportunity and energy from, you know, and again, a good example of that in a very different way is something like Quibi, you know, a new way of telling stories in short form on, you know, uh, uh, um, and so I think for me, it was another example of how, you know, the creative opportunities that present to writers, to producers uh, with all of this change. Yes, right up at the back. Yeah, great. Hi, Christine. Uh, John McVeigh from Pact. Um, Hello, come in, John McVeigh. Come in. <laughs> Hello. Um, <clears throat> a little question to Dan, uh, and I think James Thanks, John. put it uh, uh, eloquently at the beginning. The negotiations with the BBC uh, are basically about compensating people for uh, increased use, which we recognise the BBC wants and BBC licence fee, uh, fee payers want as well. <clears throat> the real point here is about not the big companies, not the big scripted projects. It's about everything else, where the BBC still require producers uh, to go and raise deficit in the market. Yeah. That deficit is getting harder to raise because of increased use. It's an economic logic. I've seen figures from the BBC in our consultations which showed that some producers are actually putting their own margins in to make programmes for the BBC, i.e. effectively working for nothing or less than nothing okay. for the BBC. Now, the BBC is not a commercial entity. It is a publicly funded institution. Isn't Dan morally embarrassed that you're requiring right. smaller producers to put their own margin in to make shows for the BBC? Right, let, let's just kind of, um, let's just get this on the record. Is the BBC requiring producers to work for nothing or less than nothing to make programmes for the BBC? <laughs> That's the question. Uh, the BBC works with more small producers than anybody else. No, no, but, yeah, but they might be penniless. <coughs> the, the, are, are, is the, the BBC... The BBC is not requiring anyone. No one has to accept a commission with the BBC. We work really well with producers. Um, you know, very many producers are very happy to work with the BBC, and we create many creative opportunities. But you haven't, asked, you haven't answered the question, though. Are the BBC requiring people to make programmes to the BBC without uh, taking any income at all? No. John? Uh, thank you. Well, I've seen the BBC... <laughs> I actually the, thought you were I've being silent and I thought that could never I've seen happen. The BBC, yeah, I've seen the BBC's own analysis, which they provided to Ofcom, so we, we can disagree on that. It was your own numbers. Uh, but the problem is, Dan, you do... They do have to work for you. If they've gone into development and you're a small producer and there is only one place that you will sell your programme because you can't take it to anyone else because you've accepted development finance, yeah. they are duty-bound, and I've seen this from, particularly from nations and regions producers, smaller producers, they will have to take the gig and they will put their margin in to close the finance because right. the BBC requires more deficit financing than any other broadcaster in the UK. Right, just let's get, let's get that. This is a kind of live negotiation, live negotiation. Yeah. Got Bal, got Bal up there. Bal's got his hand Bal's up. got a point Bal's to make. Yeah, no, let, yeah, let, 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 I think Dan must quickly answer before Bal comes in, yes. All right, look, I think the BBC is a force for good. We're doing really exciting things with viewers, we're doing really exciting things for producers, and I think, you know, we're helping people to go on a commercial journey that, you know, many, great many people are, are making money out of. We're, we're a force for good in the industry, that's my belief. Bal Samra. <laughs> well, it's going to be incredible, great field sport for you guys to listen to John <laughs> and broadcasters, and I think it might become a bit tedious. No, the, this the, is what this is about. Sure, sure. So, the, I mean, uh, the couple of things to say, I and mean, I think that just to add to what Dan has said, you know, we, the, the, uh, it's obvious that we need to get the iPlayer to 12 months, and that's exactly in line with the market, or probably behind the market. Um, and, and we are committed to, and it's good for our business, to continue to work with a range of indies. So we work with about 250 indies. That is really important for us, and we'll continue to do that. We'll find the right sort of arrangements uh, to put in place to make sure that that uh, continues. Um, and just on the kind of commercials, you know, we're having a lot of conversations, and we have lots and lots of rights holder negotiations. They're all going very well. And we do most of those behind closed doors, and they will get there. Thank Thanks. you very much. Just coming back to uh, the panel, because we've only got five minutes left. Um, this whole idea of uh, creative destruction, you know, you have end-to-end, -end, you have, you know, 
for example, every doing talent, producers, facilities, streamers, all working together, you know, um, is a danger that everybody will eventually go, I don't want everybody to be doing everything. The creators need to break out and do smaller things again. We're going to have these big, uh, you know, everybody's going to have a facilities house, they're going to have talent, they're going to have production arms. Yeah, look, I, I don't see that, Kirsty. I mean, you're talking to someone who's basically a producer, so we are producers. We don't we don't tend to stretch into facilities ownership. We do some post-production, but just where it makes economic sense. Um, and we are independent. So although we're owned by two shareholders, we sell to everyone and anyone in the market. Um, so for us, it's about creativity. It's about ideas. And, and obviously, it's about talent. I mean, this is all about talent. You know, if you haven't got good people, you aren't going to develop good shows. And that's the end of it. Um, so. For me, we're pretty focused. You're asking the wrong person, I think, because I'm not interested in broadening out. We just do what we do, and we try and do yeah. it well. Who are going to be the winners and losers in this new firmament? Oh, my God. You want me to predict that? Well, um, I mean, Gillian, you do most other things. Um, well, given I, I, I post-Trump, post-Brexit, you know, <coughs> post-Spurs not winning the Champions League, as I predicted, uh, I don't predict very much anymore. Um, uh, so, look, what I think is, you know, what I said earlier on, really, is if you're talking about winners and losers on the, on, the, on the broadcasting and buying side, I think, number one, do not underestimate the power and resilience of traditional linear broadcasters. Mm. Do not underestimate them. And, you know, you look at... You know, look, you look at the strength of ITV at the moment, you look at the strength of the BBC, um, uh, likewise with Channel 4, look across Europe at how different businesses are evolving and changing. So, number one, don't underestimate that. Number two, in terms of the OTT players, look, of course, it will be at least in part driven by but technology and distribution. Do you see more consolidation? Do you see more consolidation? Uh, um, uh, uh, well, I think, I think most people would say, yes, there will be more consolidation. How much? God knows. Yeah. But I still think, in the end, you go back to the basic principle of this is a hits business. And, you know, the winners will be defined by the shows they have and the hits they have. And in the end, that means that those OTT players and all the players need to find ways to be the most attractive and alluring partner for producers like Jane and myself and everyone else. Howard. Well, I think that we can all agree on one thing. This, this has to be the most exciting time for us mm. to be in the television business. Now, we could all be dealing with a marketplace and business models that are very much unpredictable and are changing day to day. But nevertheless, as producers, as creators of content, these other platforms that keep growing um, are giving us opportunities to sell. And on your issue of consolidation, um, I, I agree with Julian. I think it's very hard to tell whether there will be more. Um, there was a news report just recently that as a result of the uh, activist investor that just bought AT and some AT and T, a big piece of AT&T shares, that now AT&T is reconsidering its acquisition of DirecTV and may be considering divesting. So I think as bigger companies are considering gobbling up maybe additional pieces, they have to be careful about, is it going to fit within their grand scheme of st and strategy so that we don't just unilaterally buy just for the sake of getting bigger? I also think that there's one thing we, also, uh, we, we need to keep in mind, which is that this, is, this era of global cost plus players has provided an opportunity for a new set of entrepreneurs, certainly in America. You do not need to be an enormous company yeah. with an enormous bank account. Yeah. You need to have a smart business guy, a smart creative guy, a smart production guy, and a facility to cash flow. And as long as you've got a good set, a, a, a good a, a content uh, to, to sell, you can provide that to cost plus players. But I'm, but I'm going to disagree with you a bit because I do think scale in content is helpful. That is a lesson I think we are yeah, learning it's, because yeah. it's a really unsexy word, but it makes you resilient. Yeah. And resilience allows you to, the to take risks. Yeah. And I think, I think you're right. I think there are examples of super entrepreneurs who start little things and little things get to become big things. But they, they tend to get bigger if they're good, and then scale kicks in. And I think this resilience word is a word that we've all learned from banks, haven't we? Again, not a very sexy sector necessarily, but resilience <laughs> is helpful when you're taking risks, Absolutely. developing projects, and innovating. And there's just no doubt about that, yeah. I think. Dan? Well, it's uncertainty and opportunity, isn't it? Two sides of the same coin. I think that's the theme of this conference, in a way, from what I've seen so far. So it's exciting times to be in TV, I think. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank our panel very much. And...